Welcome to my continuing series on faith-based decisions. In this lesson, we begin our review of the enemy's anti-prayer warfare schemes and tactics. Ephesians 6.11b will be our base scripture and says, Take your stand against the devil's schemes, tactics, and wiles. Now, I've taken a little bit of creative license on that scripture, but you'll find as we move forward, you'll see how that goes. <clears throat> now, these words present us with the reason why the Christian soldier dresses for battle and are covered in prayer. In the last lesson, we completed our ecclesiastical study on prayer. We learned that prayer is the animator, activator, and sustainer of all believing soldiers' armor. Consequently, the context of the passage informs a believer that 1. He or she is engaged in spiritual warfare. 2. Satan is the enemy. And 3. Satan has diabolical strategies and tactics that a believer must face. It logically follows since prayer is the communication and supply line that supports the fully equipped believer, the enemy will seek now to sever the believer's prayer life supply line. And he's going to do it with his most vehement attacks. So, for the next few weeks, we're going to explore Satan's anti-prayer warfare schemes, strategies, tactics, and wiles. And I mean, depending on your version, all of those words are there. <clears throat> First, I will address the spiritual danger or being unarmed and lacking in prayer. This, that's that's going to be what we're going to talk about today. Now, our base scripture introduces the enemy as a devious and cunning manipulator. The methods of the enemy indicate the art, science, and nature of his hostile and, and methodical intent toward believers. To be clear, the enemy's power is delegated power, but his ingenuity and acuteness of intellect expresses the resolve of Satan to execute his strategies and tactics in his war plans against believers. The enemy is a subtle but lethal person. Now, I want, I want to make sure we get this clear. <clears throat> Everyone who is made in the image of God, both believer and unbeliever, are endangered by his intent against all humanity. The enemy was successful. Now think about this. The enemy was successful against humans without a sinful nature. How much more successful can he be now against humans with a sinful nature? <clears throat> that has tainted the existence of of every human being since the fall of Adam. I mean, we all are sinners saved by grace. We, we all were born sinners. Now think about this now. <clears throat> Humans without help are helpless against the enemy. It's like a sheep against a lion. <clears throat> you can have an entire flock, herd, or whatever you want to call them, of sheep, and they could not defend themselves against one lion. And as humans, we have lost what Satan, the prince of this world, has gained. And with more and more time and experience, he is much more able than he was before. <clears throat> now, the enemy, I want to get this clear. I think we've covered this before, but I want to cover it again just for review. The enemy lost his righteous wisdom as soon as he became Satan. But ever since, he has increased the effectiveness of his deception, especially with us. <clears throat> Before, now, now I want to say this, 
before we focus on the enemy's anti-prayer warfare schemes and tactics directly, here's what I want to I want to review his general overall warfare plans. I want to, you know, we're going to start big and, and really narrow our scope down to what we're, what I'm aiming at. <clears throat> we will consider, I'm, I'm going to start off here, two main goals. And through that, thereby, this is what I'm hoping to do, expose his strategies and tactics. His first main goal is to draw all believers in the sin. That's the basic, that's the basic, that's his basic bottom line strategy. And, and he does that to accomplish his second main goal, which is to accuse, frustrate, and trouble all believers. All right? So in this lesson and the next few lessons, I'm going to focus on Satan's first main goal to draw out or draw all believers into sin. Now, so this is my first point. The enemy as an influencer tempter to sin. The enemy's schemes and tactics are exposed in three ways. First, his intent in how he chooses person a person's, I want to get this, weakest and most vulnerable moment for temptation. That's his first trick. Second, in managing the temptation, how he personalizes it for the greatest impact. And three, his choice of instruments to deliver his deception. All right? So I'm going to, th this lesson is going to be about how his, his intent in choosing the most advantageous season or time for his assault on a believer's conscience. I want you to get this. The enemy, now I want to say this, the enemy knows when to make his approach. When he is most likely to succeed. As Christ can speak to a word, now I'm thinking about this, Christ knows when to speak a word in season of counsel and comfort to a doubting soul. And Satan is able to convey his evil intent with diabolical skill, speaking a word of seduction and temptation in season as well. Now, and you got to think about this, a word in season has a powerful influence. We shall review, and I'm going to review a sampling of the enemy's special seasons when he's going to when he's going to attempt or when he chooses to inject temptation. Okay, a when a believer is newly converted. Well, that's 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 right out of the box. The enemy is a predator. In the wild, predators go after the sick, weak, and young when they are most vulnerable and easiest to catch. Now, that makes sense. The attempted... Now, now I want to say this. The enemy attempted to terminate Jesus, guess what? In his infancy. From his first cry. That gave all the legions of the satanic and demonic realm alarm. They were as troubled as Herod and Jerusalem were when Jesus was born. Come on here. And sat in council to take the life or take away him before he could condemn their life. Think about that for a second. The apostle, no, 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 that's where Satan started. But let's bring it up to the apostles. The apostles were met with opposition, persecution, and martyrdom as they matured and pursued and to execute their mission. But the enemy started out pursuing them with temptations with Jesus present as newly called disciples and young converts. The enemy knew that it was best to strike the disciples while they were still trying to get their footing in the faith. When their faith and hope were undeveloped and the supplies promised 
at the Holy Spirit's coming had not yet arrived. For all of us who were once dead in trespasses and in sin, if it were not for God's grace and keeping power, we, you could wonder how a young convert would, could possibly escape with his or her life. Knowledge, being, you know, the young convert's knowledge being weak and being so vulnerable to be led astray, especially in these divided times with so many denominations, sects, and parachurches all claiming the true message of Christ. One saying, here is Christ. Another saying, there is Christ. And the new believer must sort through all these contrasting messages, hoping to find the Holy Grail, the narrow gate. Now, with only the instruction given being, choose wisely. Now, as a child, who has lost his or her way home is prone to follow anyone who offers help. It's the same thing. But we know one thing. We know that everyone who offers help does not have a righteous intent. And this is when Satan is ready to strike. So I say again, if Adam, whose knowledge was pure, could be cheated, being assaulted before he understood the impact, how much more of an advantage does the enemy have over a new convert still crippled with a sinful nature? Now, but I'm going to say this. However, it is my view, I'm going to say this, that if God is able to save a wretched sinner like you and me in the first place, he is able to keep and sustain that sinner who has been given his nature and indwelled and filled by His Holy Spirit. It is an amazing phenomenon. Now, now, this is the facts. To observe the appeal of debauchery and vice on every young generation. But God brings people out through it all. Now, B, another season. When a believer is experiencing affliction and suffering. This is a blind alley or solitary place for the enemy to pounce. Militarily, a commander seeks to first breach enemy defenses and then attack the objective. Satan's, Satan, I think about this, Satan first got permission from God to weaken Job in his estate, children, and health, and then he tempted him to impatience and despair. The enemy, think about it, here's another example, let Christ fast 40 days until what? He was hungry before he came. A temptation comes on strong when the way to relief seems to lie through the sin that Satan is enticing. When one is pure, now think about this, and Satan entices, now this is a problem, this is your test. Will you starve? rather than steal. That's a dilemma that you have to work out. C. When a believer experiences a spiritual high, watch out and watch yourself. 1 Corinthians 10, 12 says, So if you think you are standing firm, be careful that you do not fall. Satan will wait like a serpent. They call it an adder in the path that bites a horse's heel so that its rider falls backward. Zechariah 3.1 says, Then he showed me Joshua, the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right side accused him. The right hand, this is, this is you know, and it, and it made me evil, is the working hand. And the enemy standing there implies his desire and intent to hinder his activity or your activity. Okay, that's, that's the metaphor that's going on here. Paul and Barnabas had a holy design in their thoughts to visit the brethren in every city and strengthen their faith. Now, the enemy knew what a, that was going to be a big blow 
and what it might do to his kingdom and strongholds. Their visiting might actually hinder him in his circuit. So he st now so so the enemy did what? Stirred up a fight between these two men before they even started on the journey. But and, and what were they fighting over? Giving John Mark another chance. And that's in Acts 15, 36 through 39. These two remarkable periods. Now, now let me say it this way. There were two remarkable periods in Jesus' life. His entrance and his exit. His entrance into, into his public ministry at his baptism and his departure at his crucifixion. And at both, we have the enemy fiercely confronting and clashing with Jesus. I got to say it this way. The more public your place and the more imminent your service for God, the more you must accept that the enemy has dangerous plans against you. And therefore, if every soldier needs armor against Satan's darts, then the officers who lead and shepherd others in spiritual warfare much more. Okay, D. When the enemy has a weapon to enforce his temptation. Come on here. The enemy beguiled Eve when near the tree by causing her to focus her eyes on the fruit while he initiated his assault to get her looking the wrong way. To make it and to make it harder for her to resist his seduction. Eve's eyes impacted her innocent heart with an inordinate desire. Now, I said this way. Now, and, and with that, it is much easier for him to cajole a corrupted heart. Now, if he can cajole an innocent heart, what can he do with a corrupted heart? I said that earlier. By the presence of an object to excite and actuate the lust which lies dormant in all of our hearts. If a believer inadvertently or overtly lets the object of sin come near, the enemy will deceptively promise that one's desire may be granted if he or she listens to his direction. Come on here. He's prompting you now to sin. Therefore, a believer should be alerted to avoid deceptive objects of focus not to walk by or sit at the door of occasion or opportunity. Yeah, that, you got to think about that for a second. Because if, if you have the occasion but no opportunity, no problem. Or if you have the opportunity but no occasion, no problem. But when you put occasion and opportunity together, now it's up to the, your moral nature to fight this off. The deal is, resist looking at sin's counterfeit beauty with a wandering eye by which you could be taken prisoner. And do not negotiate with your thoughts that you do not want your heart to follow. I want to say it this way. Accommodation and conversation can lead to affection. That's, many, that's one of the big reasons why we say we need to sit down and get to know people and talk to them and all that to get the better understanding. But there's a negative side to that because many have learned to like and in some cases love things or people which at first they did, or they did not or could not like. Think about that. So E, after a great Here's another time when, now I'm saying, when Satan takes a season to attack you. After a great manifestation of God's love, then the tempter comes. Think about that. After God shows you he's there, the tempter comes in. Come on, think about that. Since is, such is the way, I will say it that way, of spiritual highs and lows of our wounded and weak constitution that it can neither appropriately bear the smiles or the frowns from God without a susceptibility to the enemy's traps, as has been said. It has been said. I said that way. 
Some cannot bear liberty or bondage. I mean, you can't have it good or bad. Some people can't handle it. Come on here. Paradoxically, neither can the soul. If God smiles and opens himself to us, many of us are prone to pridefulness. And then we neglect our faith because we get to thinking how good we are. If he frowns, on the other hand, others sink into lamenting and questioning their faith altogether. Thus God smile like a watering spring shower brings it brings up weeds of corruption, and God's frown is like a sharp frost that kills the flowers of grace. That's a, that's a, you, this is why we need to pray, and this is why the enemy is coming against prayer. The believer is in spiritual danger, and the enemy takes the advantage when a believer is full. As a swindler strikes the unwary heir who receives his or her inheritance or lottery winnings, I'll go that way too, and, and that person never leaves until he or she has embezzled or usurped the game. My wife can tell you a story about her uncle. He won a whole lot of money, but he didn't get a chance to spend it all, but that's another story. Thus, the enemy injects lies to beguile a believer to sin, which he knows will soon mortify or nullify his or her joy. Joseph's multicolored coat made the patriarchs plot against their brother. It is no wonder that malice prompts Satan to show his spite where Christ has set his mark of love and therefore we find him soon at Peter's elbow, making him his instrument to tempt Jesus, who Jesus rebuked and said, Get thee behind me, Satan. He that seemed or that was called out by Jesus, a rock, even now through the enemy's unction, is laid as a stone of offense on which Christ was to stumble. Likewise, David, when he had received his favor, who settled in his throne with the ruin of his enemies and was pardoned for his bloody sin and now ready to die in peace, the enemy tempts him to number the people. See, I gotta say that the enemy is ambitious with the intention to throw a believer back into the mire and the muck of sin, especially when he or she has been pardoned. Now I'm going to close out on this. <clears throat> this is the enemy's, one of the enemy's seasons at the hour of death. A believer is down, <laughs> I'll say prostrate, that's what the old folks used to say, in his or her bodily strength, the enemy at this time unmercifully and cowardly comes in to entice. At your, when you're getting ready to cross over, it is his last chance to establish an accusation. It is now or never to agitate and frustrate the dying soul. As they say of a physical serpent, it is never fully seen at length until dying. So this diabolical and mystical serpent never strains his wits and wiles more than when his time is short. The believer now, I'm saying this a minute ago, is stepping into eternity. And now the enemy attempts to tread upon his or her heel for mischief and mayhem, which he cannot stop or hinder the believer's arrival in heaven. Yet out of spite, he seeks to at least bruise the believer's heel that he or she may go into heaven with pain. That's, that, that's who we're up against. But I want to say this. I, I want to say this in closing. We're, we're going to stop here because, I want again, we're going to stay focused. 
the enemy has us doesn't doesn't really doesn't care about us. Now we we have our sinful nature. We have the thing that we want to do. We have our secret desires. We have all that, and the enemy exploits those things. And we're going to talk about this more. We we got a bunch of lessons. I we're going to take a deep dive into the enemy's arsenal against us, right? And, and we're just starting out. But I want to say. The whole, my whole discussion on prayer was to be able, or was to help us to see the necessity for, for staying, staying connected to divine by our continuous communication with the Lord. And that's what we're going to be focusing on, how the enemy will attempt to sever our connection with the head in order to make us Ineffective. Now, he can't do anything about our salvation, but he can definitely try to make us ineffective. And he does it by severing our connection with God or attempting to sever. He can't do it, but he can sever our communication with God. He can't sever the relationship, but he can separate or sever or attempt to sever our communication with God. And that's what we're going to be focused on for the next few weeks. So may God bless and keep. Amen, amen, and amen.